want to say welcome uh, to everybody today uh, in Clovis, New Mexico and at, uh, at Cary Street Fellowship in Zanesville, Ohio. We're so glad you guys are with us today. And uh, I want to share with you a message on prayer today. I want to talk to you about prayer. We're, the, we're in a series called Prayer, Six Ways to Connect with God. And I want to tell you, first of all, that, uh, that one of the themes of this series is that the pur purpose of prayer is not primarily to get things from God. If you're taking notes, it's on your handout this morning. The, the purpose of prayer is not primarily to get things from God. I know people, maybe you know people, that only pray to get things from God. Like when their life goes south and all of a sudden everything hits the fan, all of a sudden they're like, oh God, please help me, you got to get me out of this, right? Like that's the only time they pray. I would tell you that the purpose of prayer is not primarily to get things from God. Now it is that, and we'll talk about that as we go, but the primary purpose of, of prayer is to connect with Him and in His presence to be transformed and empowered. When you get face to face with God, it's like a fire poker that gets shoved down into a, into a deep, hot fire. My, my grandpa uh, used to be, uh, was the, the son of a, of a blacksmith and he had all the, the anvil and the old bellows that you crank. You know, you ever seen guys do that? They crank the bellows and that the shoves oxygen up into the fire. The fire gets real hot and I've seen them, I've seen them show me how to work those things. And I've, saw, I've seen guys do that and I've, I've seen them put uh, the, the steel down in the fire, put the iron down in the fire and crank that bellows and the fire gets hot, hot, hot. And when they pull it out, some of the fire has gotten into the iron. Right? And that's, this is the purpose of prayer. When we get together with God, God rubs off. His, his power gets into us and we get transformed in His presence. And uh, so, let's talk about today, let's talk about one of the things that is necessary in prayer. First of all, if faith in prayer is what I'm talking about today, faith in prayer is necessary. And just in case you're not convinced of that, let's do some scripture real quick. Ready, Mark 11:24. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Now that's... That's a mind-blowing promise right there. Wow, believe that you have received it. That's faith on the next level, isn't it? Not just that God can do it or that He might do it, but that you have received it. It's as good as done. You see the power of faith? Believe, and it's yours. James 1.5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to everyone without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he, believe, when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea tossed and blown about by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. If you're just a doubt, you're just doubting, oh, I'm just not sure if God's going to really do anything about this, why should God answer, right? Now, sometimes he does. Sometimes he does. But he's saying, believe and don't doubt. Look at Matthew 17, 20. Because, Jesus replied, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth. If you have a faith as small as the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move. And nothing will be impossible for you. That verse and the one up in Mark eleven twenty four 24 are at the, written at the top of my prayer list because I need to be reminded of that every time I'm going to prayer. Nothing will be impossible for you. I need to remember that every time I walk into the presence of God. Nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible. James 5, 15. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise him up. Okay. Are you convinced? If you're convinced, say amen. Amen. All right. What is faith then, right? How do I know, how do I, know that I have faith? Because I see these people on t TV, these professional Christians wearing $5,000 suits, and they, they want to tell you that, that faith is you just name it and claim it, and here comes the blessing. God's a vending machine in heaven, and faith is your 50 cents, and you punch the right code, and poof, fall it down, it falls, and you take out your blessing out of the big vending machine in the sky. And is that faith? Uh, no, it's not. What, is, what does it mean? What does it mean to have faith? 
Well, let's look at Hebrews 11, 6, all right? This is my favorite passage in all the, all the, the scripture to define what faith is. In college, Dr. Alan Brown, uh, one of my teachers, drilled this verse and these three things into us as students. I don't know how many times I've heard him say this. The three indispensable elements of faith. Faith is three parts. If you're missing something in it, you don't have faith like what the Bible means when it says faith. Okay? Here we go. What is faith? And it, let's read out loud together Hebrews 11:6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Faith has three elements. Are you ready? Number one, faith believes what God says. Faith believes what God says. God says, I am. You see that? It says, he must believe, whoever comes to God must believe he exists. Did you know God never tries to defend his existence? He doesn't. He doesn't try to offer big philosophical, philosophical arguments about here's why I exist and let me prove it to you. He just said, in the beginning, God created. He just assumes that he's real, right? I'm here, deal with it. Okay, that's for he. Whoever comes to God must believe that he exists. Now, God says more than just the fact that he exists, but he says he does. In other words, we have to be willing to believe what God says. Now, I know people who never get past that. They have this mental faith that says, I look at that, and yeah, I believe that's true. Now, let me tell you, the devil believes God like this. Okay, the devil's got that much faith. He believes God exists. He, he believes, he knows God tells the truth. He's been in God's presence. He used to be one of the chief angels until he decided he wanted to be like the Most High and rise up and rebel against him and was kicked out of heaven. He's been there. He knows God better than you do. At least in his way. In his way. And so I, faith believes what God says. That's first level faith. But you've got to have it, right? You've got to have this mental assent that I believe that what God says is true. Despite what I feel or despite what anybody else says, I believe what God says is true. Secondly, faith trusts in what God promises. Faith trusts in what God promises. This is a is beyond just a mental faith. It's just be, it's beyond just a mental thing. Let me see if I can explain what I'm talking about. I believe that this stool will hold me. Mentally, I look at it and I say, I believe that. Um, people on the video can't see it, so I'm gonna raise it up. All right. <laughs> I believe that that stool will hold me. I look at it, and now the, the joints are a little shaky. I bought it from Walmart. <laughs> but I look at it, and I say, you know, wood? I, I know about wood. Sounds good. Looks all right. Yeah, I believe it'll hold me. Now, the next question is, do I emotionally trust it enough to sit on it, right? <laughs> Because if I don't rest on it, do I really believe it? No. Not in the way the Bible's talking about when it says faith. I, got, I can't sit down because it's going to mess with my microphone cable, okay? <laughs> I, I, can't sit, I can't just mentally believe in that and that be Bible faith. You've got to be willing to trust it enough to rest on it. In fact, Dr. Brown used to say, trusts in and rests on what God promises. That's what he used to say. You've got to be willing to rest yourself on the promises that God makes. Now, here's the thing. That's a new level, isn't it? From just mentally believing that God's telling the truth to be able to emotionally rest on Him. You see, He said, I accept you. Do you emotionally rest on that or do you live your life desperately scared and trying to prove that, you, that God's, you're worthy of God's love? 
You know, you see what I'm saying? God said, I forgive you. Do you believe that or do you just mentally always struggle over whether or not he really forgave you for what you did back there when the devil brings it back up to you? You know what I'm saying? There's a difference between mentally believing and emotionally resting on the promises of God. He said, I'll supply your needs. Do you just believe that mentally or do you rest on it enough to put your, your finances under his control? Do you feel like you're responsible and you have to work all the time? You have to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to, because otherwise it's never going to, you can't relax. You know, God said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. You know why he gave us the Sabbath? For you, because he said you need a day off. You need a day off. You weren't designed to be a human doing, you were designed to be a human being. And one day a week you ought to stop doing and be. That's, wh that's why he said it, because he loves you. And he said, I can take care of you just as good in six days as you can take care of you in seven days. I'm that good. Better. Yeah. And better, yeah, better, right. Number three, faith commits to do what God requires. Those who, I want you to look at this, it says that he exists and that he rewards, that's the trusting it, emotionally resting on what God promises, those who earnestly seek him. Faith commits to do what God requires. And this is the element that I think, the last two elements are the ones that most people are missing when it comes to Bible faith. When it comes to biblical faith, those two elements are the ones that primarily get left out. Because it, faith is supposed to involve the whole person, the mind, the emotions, and the will. Faith is, it involves the will. You have to choose, right? You have to decide that I will do what God asks and I'm going to rest in that and relax in that as well as just believing with my head. Faith involves the whole person, the mind, the will, and the emotions. Faith commits to do what God requires. Now listen. If you don't trust God enough to do what he asks, you don't believe him. Right. No, you don't. You don't believe him. No, I believe in God. I'm a person of deep faith. No, if you're not willing to do what God asks, even when you don't think it's right, you don't believe him. You, you believe you. And that's, what most, that's where most people are living. Most people in the world today don't believe God. They believe themselves. Some people believe other. They'll believe anything. They'll believe anything somebody else tells them. They believe the script they were handed from their childhood. Here, this is your script. This is your part. Read this part. You're worthless. You're, you're awful. You're terrible. And you'll never be worth anything in all your life. And people take that. Well, I guess this is my lot in life. I just have to read this script. I was given. Tear that script up, throw it away, and let God give you a new one? Do you believe what God says about you? Do you rest in His promises, and do you do what He requires? That's what it means to have faith. Now let's talk about how to boost your faith, alright? Let's talk about how to boost your faith. If that's what faith is, Darrell, how do I develop it then, okay? I want to pray and have better faith. I want to have a deeper connection with God in prayer. I want to see more prayers answered. How do I increase my faith? Ready? Here we go. Number one, in prayer, here's how to boost your faith. Number one, start with praise. Start with praise. Yes. Last week, I, I talked a little bit about this. When I'm praying, I start, I have 20 pages of Scripture printed out from the Psalms that I organized in my prayer notebook. And by the way, you ought to get you a prayer notebook. You, yes, you may get a copy. You, you, have to, you need to get you a prayer notebook, all right? Because it's, it's a good way to write things down and things that God's talking to you about, jot them down, what He says to you, what you feel, what you sense in your heart, write it down. I have 20 pages of Scripture organized 
by, by attribute. I, I sorted it out. I went through the whole book of Psalms and I would take a verse and write it down with this topic and write it down with that topic until finally I got to the place where I see on day five, which is today's is the fifth, is today the fifth of September? Six. Sixth. It's today's day sixth. Yes, I'm, I'm getting my days mixed up. Today is day six. God is everlasting. Psalm 45, six. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And I say, praise God. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. In a week when everybody's freaked out about whether the Democrats or Republicans are in charge and whether, you know what? Your throne, O God, is forever and forever. You get into, God, into God's presence and you start praising Him and it boosts your faith. Boost your faith because you remember who He is. Who He is. Look at Matthew 6, 9 and 10. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy or set apart or special, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you see Jesus taught us to do this? Start with God. Start praising Him. God, you're awesome. And even when I hurt, you're awesome. And even when I've... Am I making sense? All right. Number two... If how to boost your faith, get to know God better. Get to know God better. Now I'm going to talk to you about how to do that in a second. But look at Psalm 9:10. I love this verse. Those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Do you see what he's saying? You know God and you automatically trust Him more. Do you see that? You want to trust God more in prayer? You want to have more faith? Get to know Him because when you know Him, you trust Him. How many of you have met some people, the better you know them, the less you trust them? Okay? How many of you know some people, the better you know them, the more you trust them? You get to know them more and more and you're like, man, I could hand that dude a hundred bucks and say, go do that. And he would do it. You know, it, you can trust that guy. I, I could trust that guy with my whole life savings. He's that kind of guy. Yeah. And you know God better. You, the better you know God. I'm not sure what the joke was, but anyway. Uh, the better you know God. What's that? Or 50 bucks. Well, yeah. If you don't have 100 bucks. <laughs> Carrying on, anyway, okay, here we go. Know God better through His names. Okay, if you're taking notes, one way is through His names. God has various names in Scripture, uh, particularly in the Old Testament. They're given in compound form. God's name is Yahweh in, in Hebrew, and it's combined. It's in, in English, sometimes you might hear Jehovah. Basically, that's a transliteration into English. It's not a very good one, but uh, it, Yahweh would be the more specific noun to pronounce it, the way to pronounce it. But it's four letters. There's no, there's no vowels. It's uh, W, it's Y. H W H. Uh, normally in English you would spell it kind of Y A H W E H. That's the way you would spell it in, in English. But um, yeah, he would he combines his name in the Old Testament with with other words and puts them together and makes them names of God. For instance, Yahweh Jireh or Je Jehovah Jireh. The word in, in 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 Hebrew means the Lord my provider. Um, another one is Jehovah Rapha, Yahweh Rapha. The, the Lord my healer. Uh, Yahweh Siddikinu, uh, the Lord my righteousness. Yeah, all these names that he has, I encourage you on your own time, check that out sometimes, study that out. That's a, that's a neat study. Get him to know better through his names. But hear this, knowing God's name, when it says in Psalm 910, those who know my name will put their trust in me, doesn't just mean knowing his names. In, in the Old Testament or in Scripture, a person's name is, is kind of synonymous with their character, their whole reputation. In fact, in Proverbs, maybe you've read, it is uh, where it says, uh, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. How many of you heard that? That quoted sometime. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. He's not saying, oh, your mom and dad should have named you differently. You know, he's not saying a good name. Oh, Jim, that's a good name. Oh, yeah, Dan, that's a bad name. He's, he's not saying... <laughs> Just picking on Dan. He's not saying that that's what, that, that it's the name. What he's saying is this. It is better to have a good reputation 
it's better to good, have a good character than to be wealthy and to be a liar, right? right? <laughs> to be rich and nobody trusts you. It's better to have a good name. And so when it says those who know your name will put their trust in you. It's not just the people who know how to spell Yahweh, okay? It's the people who know who He is and know His character. You see, God's character, He's a God who parts the Red Sea. He's a God who feeds His people even if He has to drop bread out of the sky to do it. He's a God who gives His people water from a rock. Have you read that story? He's a, guy who, he's a God who gives his people three Hebrew boys fireproof suits in a, in a furnace. He's a God who makes loaves and fishes multiply and feeds 5,000 men with one boy's lunch. He's a God who gives the lame the ability to walk and makes the blind to see. He calms the winds and the waves when the boat in your life is tossing. He's a God who is a forgiver of sins. He's a changer of hearts. He takes adulterers and makes them faithful. He takes liars and makes them truthful. He takes sinners and makes them saints. He takes lazy people and makes them diligent. He makes broken, takes broken homes and puts them back together. He breaks the chains of the addict. He sets free those who have been bound. He releases the captive and the slave. He heals the brokenhearted and he satisfies the hungry. He's that kind of God. You see, you need to know, the better you know God's reputation, the more faith you're able to have in Him. He's that kind of God. You don't believe it? Have you ever read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, do you not know the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And check this verse out. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. He's that kind of God. He changes people. That's his reputation. Yes, he does. Number four. Number four, meditate on God's promises. Meditate on God's promises. 2 Peter 1, 4. Through, through these, He has given us His gr very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world caused by evil desires. Number five. Number five. I can't stay there because I've only got a couple of minutes left. Let's keep it moving. Number five. Obey. Obey. How to boost your faith. Now, wait a minute. Daryl, come on. Obey. Is that really a way to boost your faith? Oh, yeah. In fact, it's one of the best ones. It's one of the best ones. There is very little you can do to boost your faith like obeying God. In fact, John 7, 17. Let's look at it. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Jesus said, you want to know the truth? You want to, have, you want to be able to believe what I'm saying to you? If you're willing to do God's will, that's when you know. That's when you know. Are you willing to obey Him? The more you obey Him, the greater your faith grows. The less you obey, the weaker your faith gets. Because when you obey God, it works out your faith muscle. There's a story that's told some years ago about a man named Blondin, Charles Blondin. Charles Blondin was a tightrope walker, professional tightrope walker. How many of you have seen tightrope walkers? You've seen somebody do that? Uh, the Walinda family and all those people, the daredevil folks. And, uh, Blondin was the first man to walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. He, uh, he got uh, out there on the tightrope and they strung the tightrope across and, and he grabbed his, his pole and stepped out onto the wire and walked across that raging Niagara Falls uh, River right across the top of the falls. One slip and he'd have been killed. 
but he walked across the falls, got all the way to the other side, and the crowd went crazy, cheering and clapping and throwing hats in the air. You know, it was, it was a big moment. And then he said, how many of you believe instead of carrying a balance pole across, I could, I could push a wheelbarrow across the falls? And people, you know, hands go up, yeah, yeah, we believe you can do it. He said, how many of you believe I could put a person in the wheelbarrow and push it across the falls? Yeah, and he said, how many of you would like to get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is, this is a true story. This is a true story. A man got in the wheelbarrow and he pushed him across the falls. He did. In fact, the story goes even a little further than that. He also asked a man if he would, if he'd be willing, if there was anybody willing to be carried on his back across the falls. And he went back with a man on his back. He started across the falls. A person, they, they tell me, they, the story is told like this. A person rushed forward, a gambler who had bet that he couldn't make it across the falls, rushed forward and cut one of the guy wires that steadied the rope. Rushed forward and cut the wire, and it began to sway while he was carrying the man on his back. And he said, sir, get off my back just for a moment. And the man slipped down and stood on the wire holding on to his shoulders. And he said, now listen to me very carefully. You're going to get back on my back and I'm going to run. And he said, you do not sway. If he said, you do not try to correct. If I sway, you sway with me. He said, you are one part with me from here on out. Because if I sway and you try to correct, you'll mess up my balance and we're dead. The man climbed back up onto his back and he ran the rest of the way across the line and made it safely back to the other side. Now here I want to tell you, listen to me, listen to me. It's one thing to believe God can change somebody's life. It's one thing to believe God's real and He created. But in your life this week, sometime in prayer, it may be something that you're trying to believe God for. Maybe some difficult situation in your life and God's going to say, how many believe I can make it through? Yeah, yeah, it was easy on Sunday, wasn't it? Yeah, oh, God's great. Get in the wheelbarrow. <coughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Will you get in the wheelbarrow? Will you put yourself utterly and completely at the mercy of the promises of God? Will you believe what God says, trust in what God promises, and be willing to commit to do anything He requires? My friend, you'll make it through. And you'll connect with God on levels you never knew were possible. And there will come a day you will rejoice because God will bring you out the other side of the trial you're going through victorious in Him because He's that good. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray.